I'm Marty Stauffer. The domestic dog has won a place in our hearts, granted no other animal. Millions are kept as pets, and we spend millions of dollars on them. Dogs, at least the domestic variety, are everywhere. Surprisingly, man's best friend is closely related to the wild dogs, foxes, coyotes, and wolves. And in fact, the wolf species is the great grandfather of all domestic dogs. But for many years, wild dogs have been feared and misunderstood. Today, at last, we are learning about their role in a balanced ecosystem. And we are becoming fascinated by the social behavior of the wild dogs. The study of wild dogs, or canids, has taken me to some of the most remote areas of the country. In these balanced natural ecosystems, the wild dogs still live and hunt as they have for ages, since long before the presence of man. The coyote prefers small animals like this muskrat. But catching a meal is not always easy and so the coyote moves on. It's most likely to take what is easiest to catch, like domestic sheep. They're much slower and less alert than wild prey. Man tries at every opportunity to stop the coyote in its tracks. But we've laid out an incredible feast of livestock on our public lands, and then we complain when predators like the coyote join in. Yet in a very real sense, we are the intruders here. Given a choice, the controversial coyote will live primarily on rodents and other small animals. When not hunting for voles, as it is here, this wild dog will look for creatures like ground nesting birds, reptiles and amphibians, and other small mammals, such as this ground squirrel, or these deer mice. Been calculated that a coyote left to feed on mice alone could consume 10,000 of them in one year. In practical terms, these 10,000 rodents can do far more damage than a single coyote killing an occasional sheep. Since World War II, 
rodents have destroyed more grain in fields in this country than we have sent abroad to hungry peoples. And that's just a conservative estimate. The close cousin of the coyote is the red wolf. It once roamed the southern areas of the country, but is now extinct in the wild. Before man knew anything about the benefits of this canid, he killed it off, mainly because of occasional raids on his livestock. In its last days, the red wolf led a rather solitary life hunting small game, like these quail, and eating plants and berries. This wolf, the smallest in the world, hunts no more. These films were taken in the recent past when there were still a few red wolves left in Texas and Louisiana. Like all wild dogs, the red wolf has a close-knit family life. I think it's ironic that this creature we call bloodthirsty and brutal is so loving and affectionate. Training of the intelligent, curious pups begins early in their lives, when their mother introduces them to prey by bringing it back to the den. Sometimes a mother must curb her youngster's endless curiosity. And although I may be giving this wolf human traits, it certainly seems as if she is teaching her wayward pup a lesson by carrying it back home in such an uncomfortable way. It's no accident that these timber wolves, also called gray wolves, resemble German shepherds. Wolves are the ancestors of all domestic dogs. There is evidence that about 15,000 years ago, wolves began to associate with man, following hunting tribes and eating what they left behind. Gradually, over centuries, the wild dogs became domesticated by man. For our own pets, and hunting dogs, we selected out the most admirable and useful traits from these wild dogs. Their loyalty, communication, affection, and hunting skills. Largest of all the wild dogs, the timber wolf has the largest prey. But a single wolf cannot kill a single deer. If one and all are to eat, the wolves must work in a cooperative pack. It is from this method of group hunting that the wolves' highly structured social order evolved. Each individual has a place in the pack's hierarchy.
By using this group hunting technique, wolves in different areas of North America can take down such large prey as caribou, elk, and even moose, animals that may be 10 times the weight of a single wolf. Just as in any group, there are leaders and followers. In the wolf pack, an individual status is constantly displayed by submissive or dominant body language. A domestic dog will look up to its human master as a superior and will act as a subordinate. The strong social drive of all canids makes a tame dog stay with its master in the same way a wild dog stays with its pack. As much as we love our tame pets, we hate the wild dogs. Every day we can experience the loyalty and affection of our own dogs, but we seldom have the chance to see the wild canids making their most important contribution. As top dogs in a naturally balanced ecosystem, keeping their prey healthy and strong by weeding out the weak and diseased. The small arctic fox must face the most severe climate of any wild canid and has a most unusual adaptation, turning white in winter and dark in summer. Its summer coat may be any shade from light gray to black. These solitary animals communicate over long distances by barking. and they cover wide areas of tundra in search of their main food, rodents called lemmings. But their small size does not limit these resourceful foxes to small prey. During the barren winter, an arctic fox will follow a polar bear for weeks on end. When the bear kills a seal, the fox too will feed. Also found in Alaska is the red fox. These diving Jaegers are trying to chase a prowling fox away from their nearby nest. The danger gone, the Jaeger can once again settle down to the task of incubating its eggs. The fox also has family duties. I think these young fox, or kits, look and act much more cat-like than the wolf pups seen earlier. Even their name, Kits, suggests their resemblance. The red fox mother, or vixen, is very tolerant of her active kits and very responsive to their needs. She has a unique habit, caching, or burying food for later use. In the feast and famine world of the wild hunter, this behavior is essential, but rarely seen. This rabbit won't last long with her growing pups. Both mother and father hunt continually and bring food back to the den. The name, of course, is red fox, but in the northern areas, they're not always red. 
The mother's dark cross on her shoulders marks her as a cross fox. There's also a silver fox, actually black. But all three color phases belong to the red fox species. The pups in one litter can be any color. Although these were filmed in a remote area of Alaska, the red fox, the sly and cunning animal of legend and fairy tale, can live almost anywhere, even very close to man. As they do here in central Colorado, only yards away from a ranch house and a major highway. In fact, man's activities have opened up huge new areas for the red fox which prefers fairly open range and demands little of its environment. Here, it shares its territory with a mountain bluebird. The red fox can now be found from the Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. These kits were born in April. By June, when I discovered them, they were spending most of the day outside, playing for hours. Soon they will learn the art of hunting from their parents. And by fall, unless shot for stealing chickens or run over by a car, will go their own ways and take up new hunting grounds. The gray fox is another species that does not live up to its name. Its coat is often more reddish than gray. Mother drops food at the den and she goes off to continue hunting. Her kits do some play hunting on their own. This endless play is vital training for all young canids. It teaches them the smell, taste, and feel of future prey. But the gray fox, like many of the wild dogs, is not only a predator. It is also a vegetarian and a scavenger, eating berries, fruit, and animals killed by other predators. The gray fox has a fascinating behavior. Using its long curved claws, it can climb a tree to escape its enemies or to look for food. If I thought the red foxes were cat-like, the tree climbing of these gray foxes makes them seem even more so. And they practice their skill at a very early age. Both the gray and red fox are trapped for women's fur coats, but both seem to be holding their own in most areas. Gray foxes are now found from Canada to South America. This one, climbing high above the ground in a buckeye tree, was filmed in southern Ohio. The prairies of our western states are home for the small, rare, swift fox. Even a full-grown fox is amazingly tiny, 
about the same size as a house cat. While the pups, too young to hunt, remain at the den, the mother fox must find food for them. It shares this prairie in Wyoming with other species, like the pronghorn antelope, too large, of course, for a fox to catch. In this parched land, a water hole attracts many animals. For the fox, it's a welcome stop on her hunting rounds. But a mother fox with hungry kits cannot stop for long. Always curious, she investigates a striped skunk. But its size and smell are too much for this little canid. She continues tracking prey, using her keen nose and ears. This white-tailed jackrabbit will make an abundant meal for her growing young. By fall, the vixen's kits will leave her, and by winter, she will once again be alone. Now in a warm winter coat, she hunts only for herself scanning the plains for her next meal. On the alert for the smallest sound or movement. And traveling, always traveling. Summer and winter, the various rodents are a mainstay for the fox. Like the red fox, the swift fox will bury its food for later. It seems sad that this small, harmless swift fox has almost disappeared, mainly because of poisoning campaigns aimed at its more controversial relative, the coyote. Here, looking like it hasn't a care in the world. Its relations with man have been anything but carefree. Yet when persecuted intensely, it seems to bound back with renewed strength. And since the founding of our country, the coyote has greatly expanded its range. This coyote would love to make a meal of these sandhill cranes. Engrossed in their mating ritual, and seemingly unaware of the nearby predator. Perhaps the cranes know that this limping dog will be no threat, just so they keep their flight distance.
even in the midst of plenty, this coyote may go hungry, or it may go back to doing what it does best, that is, catching rodents. This remains the coyote's most important role, whether it lives in the country or the city. Like the rodents and birds it hunts, the coyote has a phenomenal birth rate. It can quadruple its numbers annually. All the wild dogs, wolves, coyotes, and foxes are resourceful, well-adapted, and intelligent, just like man. We are finally beginning to understand and appreciate the wild dogs, their complex social behavior, and their role as predator. But we must stop trapping and hunting them needlessly. We must allow them to live, to fulfill their natural role. Without these vital predators, we may never restore many of our ecosystems to their natural balance, and we may never fully realize the true value of the wild dogs. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.